Praise the Lord. I want to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone out there, wherever you may be, wherever this uh, video might find you uh, across the internet and every other place. Amen. We praise God for being here. Uh, I want to share with you uh, the Bible study, the word that God gave me, <clears throat> and some of it he's given me some time ago, but he's really uh, brought it back to fruition here recently um, with the events of things that are going on. Uh, he has really placed this on my heart, and I want to talk about it. Amen. So just give me a minute here, and we'll get started in there. All these technicalities are doing all these little different things, but you know what? The Lord is good. Amen. He's going to uh, continue to bless. Now, what we're going to do here is um, I'm going to share with you this, but we're going to also do it in, um, in a PowerPoint form. So kind of juggling several things around here, but just be patient with me. And as far as chiming in on chats and texts, um, at this point, I won't be participating in that because it's going to be a little difficult for me. Um, you may hear a little feedback as well, uh, but God willing, we'll get past that. And we'll be able to uh, produce better product uh, going forward in the future. So we'll start out with prayer. Precious Lord, we thank you for your blessings, allowing us to be here. We thank you for life, health, and strength. And God, we ask that you continue to look on us. So God, help us, Lord, to discern your spirit. God, help us to be diligent in your word, God, and help us to receive what you have for us, oh God, with a humble heart, in Jesus' name, amen. So I, I want to begin uh, talking to you about a particular subject that uh, I'll have to explain the, the subject matter uh, in general, all right? So the subject, and I'll show you here. This is the subject. Now we're released in power ministries, amen. And the subject of this Bible study is historically perpetual systematically systemic bondage. Now I know that's a mouthful, <laughs> amen. Uh, it is definitely a mouthful. Historically perpetual systematically systemic bondage. And we're talking about church bondage, church slavery amen and i know some of you uh may not feel that there's slavery in the church how are you talking about there's no such thing slavery in the church yeah 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 uh, but you'll be surprised uh, of what your brothers and sisters in christ may be going through and they may be surprised and maybe what you are going through what you may have gone through amen the things i'm teaching i don't teach just because i've read it in a book but uh i teach uh, from experience and from God's anointing and word that he puts in my heart. Uh, so I want to share this with, uh, with everyone. So historically, perpetual, systematically, systemic bondage in the church. Uh, let's, let's start off with um, our first scripture here. So we're going with Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, Woe unto you, pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep, of my pasture, said the Lord. Therefore, thus said the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, said the Lord. He goes on to say, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, said the Lord. You're probably wondering why did I uh, picked that particular scripture. Well, because uh, we have a lot of pastors that are totally destroying and decimating uh, God's flock. Amen. They, um, 
They mistreat people. Uh, they have no good intentions. And those that have good intentions have such poor habits and characteristics that they've acquired from the past. That's why the portion of it says historical, historically. They've historically have, have, have gained these things and hard to let go of. So now let me kind of break down the subject matter. And then at the end, we can just break it down and just call it church bondage. All right. So uh, to define bondage is the state of being a slave. Now, that's not too difficult to deal with. Uh, we're all familiar with that. We're familiar with uh, what history has taught us of our ancestors. And amen. those of you that have not suffered that or you're not uh, part of the lineage of that, uh, you know from history and reading the books what has transpired, amen, in the past 400 years when it comes to slavery, bondage, and, and injustice. All right, so now the definition, and I'm reading on my notes here, so if I go back and forth, just bear with me. <laughs> the, historically means, as I said before, uh, with reference to past events, historically accurate picture of time. And if you want to use some synonyms to kind of help you go through with that and understand it more, I'm going to just read them off and you grab the one which fits best for you. Normally, generally, habitually, customarily, standardly, routinely, regularly, typically, ordinarily, commonly, conventionally, traditionally, as a rule, as a general rule, in general, in the general run of things, by and large, more often than not, almost always, in the main, mainly, mostly, for the most part, most of the time, and on the whole. So that gives you kind of an understanding of historically. So we understand that bondage on the whole, historically, has already been and always been there, uh, especially for African Americans. But this is just not um, a Bible lesson on uh, race and heritage, but it's on this systemic structure that's in the church. So now, perpetual means never ending or changing. And a lot of you can testify to that right now. Situations in your church, they're not ending, they're not changing. Your leader is not who you think they are. They don't treat you as according to the word of God. You know, uh, one scripture uh, says, and I'm paraphrasing, that he that would be great among you must be your servant. Amen. Now, we're not going around saying that the leaders have to get on their hands and knees and serve you as, like, a, like a slave. <laughs> no, but they should have the heart of a servant. Amen. But we, we find that things have gotten turned around and misconstrued and just taken way out of proportion throughout the line of time. Systematically means according to a fixed plan or system, methodically and purposefully thought out. So when something is systematically, somebody has taken the time to figure that thing out, okay? Now systemic, it means it's system-wide, affecting or relating to a group or a system. In other words, um, an example, the coronavirus is systemic. In other words, it doesn't just attack one part of the body, but it attacks the body as a whole. Uh, sy systemic racism, it, it, it attacks the, the people, the African-American people. Systemic injustice means the laws as a whole altogether are, are unjust. So these are some of the things that we want to talk about. Um, but I got some more scriptures that I want to share with you, so bear with me. And uh, by God's grace, we'll get this thing going and move right along here. All right. So I want to share with you a quote by the Honorable Frederick Douglass. There's two quotes, but it's, I want to share them both with you. And the first one says, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference so wide that to receive the one is good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. It says to be the friend of one is of a necessity to be the enemy of the other. He says, I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle 
plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Now, we know that he was speaking from his time, the period of time that he was in. So we understand that. But I want you to look at this spiritually as well on how this it is culminating. Amen. Now, he has another quote. And I really like this one. It says, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. It is our duty and our obligation to bring up our children in the way that they should go. Because if we bring them up in the admonition of Christ, amen, with the true unadulterated word of God, then we can prevent a lot of this nonsense from happening. Now, Men and women of today that are treating people in this fashion that I'm speaking of, and I'll get to uh, more scripture to back it up, uh, they're broken. And it's hard, hard to repair broken men. Amen. And we're talking about mankind, men and women both. We have men leaders, women leaders, and we won't go into the whole gender issue, but we have broken people, broken leaders. And they are breaking people, damaging people. They're damaging people to the, to the point where years down the line, they're still dealing with and trying to work through uh, all the burdens that were placed upon them simply because of the spirit that that leader carried. All right? And we, we want to make sure that we don't convey that or continue to perpetually produce that kind of fruit. God's going to hold us accountable for that. Amen. So to make sure amen, that you get the word of God and get it right in your heart and in your spirit and don't pick up these little isms and schisms and idiosyncrasies that are being dropped by these conniving uh, <laughs> leaders. Now, you have some leaders that uh, they won't allow you to leave the church. Now, imagine that. You, you, you're trying to go somewhere, uh, you want to move out of town and uh, restart life or whatever it might be. You know, there are some leaders that will sit there and over the pulpit openly shame you, make you feel like you have no business leaving the church. And if you do, <laughs> rest assured, you can't be saved anywhere else. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that soon. They make you feel like you're cursed. Uh, uh, you know, uh, until God returns, you have no forgiveness unless you come back to that ministry, you know, and then show yourself humble, you know, so then they can get up in the pulpit and talk about, you know, how faithful and humble you are and how you, you know, let down your pride and all this nonsense. Man, that stuff is for the devil. We need to put that stuff where, where it belongs. Amen. And that's, that's me talking. Um, First John 5. 43 and 44 says, I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. He says, how can ye believe which you receive honor uh, one of another? And he said, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. So the, the, they, will, they will manipulate you and have manipulated you to the point to where you stop following the rules and ordinance of God and you start doing whatever it takes to please them. You're becoming man pleasers, not even pleasing God. You know, it, it's, it's funny, and, and no one's exempt. I, I, I'm almost willing to guarantee that everyone that watches this video have dealt with or suffered this at one point or another in your Christian walk. Amen. Um, I'm willing to guarantee or use a bet, however you want to put it, that you have. I mean, even I have. Even coming up, it was a point to where I didn't even, not that I didn't fear God, but some of the things that kind of kept me kind of on a straight path, narrow, was sometimes I used to think, I'm out and about, and randomly it would come to my mind, what if my pastor was here and they were walking by? Oh, I better make sure that I'm not doing anything wrong. And, and I had no mind to do anything wrong, but that's just the way the enemy works. Bondage works on the psyche. And it starts to twist and tighten and you go into turmoil over things that should not even be. Most of them don't even exist. Uh, they manipulate by teaching uh, unconditional loyalty, you know, uh, like the loyalty with David and Jonathan. 
Now, I, I want to share some scripture with you here, and I want you to go back, and I want you to read those chapters for yourself, because there's a lot in it, and I can't really bring it all out in this lesson. Um, but I'm going to point out, and I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the, the spirit of most leaders that you come across. And if you haven't come across one, I, I guarantee you stay in that church long enough, uh, you will come across it. And some of these leaders have a spirit that's just impossible to, to really believe, so to speak. But when you're young and impressionable in Christ, you're trying to do all you can to be right. So they're able to mold you and, and, and shape you into this, what they want you to be. So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 20, uh, verses 5 through 6. And I want you to read this chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 20. 21 and I want to say 22 uh, but read those I want you to see what kind of person Saul was and I want to see the kind of, I want you to see the kind of people that attracted and attached themselves to Saul all right so starting with verse 5 it says and David said unto Jonathan behold tomorrow is the new moon and says and I should not fail to sit with the king at me but let me go that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even he said, if thy father at all miss me, then say David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there uh, is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. Now get this. So now let me kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Break it down. Saul had been trying to kill David for quite some time. And not because David had done him any injustice, not for anything that David had done, all David did was serve Saul. But the problem with David was that he was anointed to be the king. He was anointed to take Saul's throne because it wasn't Saul's by right. The people wanted a king. They wanted to be like the rest of the nation. So God permitted it to be so, but he let them know what he would do in the process. And so th this is where, uh, where David was. This, he, he's, he's, he's going through this ordeal and what he's doing, he's struggling because Saul wants to kill him. And he's making every effort that he can to kill David. So David didn't want to go to this feast because he knew that Saul would try to kill him. So day one of the feast comes and David's not there. And I will we'll read some of it. And then day two comes. And after a while, Saul's like, yo, where's David at? And I'm paraphrasing it. You know, he's supposed to be here, you know, at this meeting. And, you know, Jonathan being Saul's son, you know, like, he's like, oh, man, my daddy ain't trying to kill you, man. You know, we boys, hype, we, we, hype, man. No, nah, I'm not, no, man, you got it wrong. You misunderstand it. And that's what a lot of, I call them cronies. A lot of you cronies say about your leader when they're persecuting unjustly one of God's children. You say, no, 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 he, that, God is just showing them something. God's not showing them nothing. That's the devil using them, and they're using that tactic to hold them in bondage and mistreat them, and you're sitting there defending them. God's going to hold you accountable for that as well. So I hope I'm not talking to you, but if I am, I'm talking to you. Amen? So we, we got to be careful with this. We don't want to fight ourselves on the wrong side of the battle with God. So now let's see what happened with, uh, with David and Jonathan and Saul. Okay, so uh, chapter 20, verses 7 and 8 says, David's still talking. If he say thus, it is well. Thy servants shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt uh, deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding. If there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. Uh, so for why should why, why shouldst thou bring me to thy father? So David is pleading this case, and he's saying, look, Jonathan, if that's the case, if I'm out of pocket, you kill me. You ain't got to take me to your father. You do it. It's your right. You know, you're the heir. So you do it. You kill me. So he goes on a little bit further, uh, verses 9 and 10. And Jonathan said, far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that that evil were determined by my father to come upon you, he says, then would not I tell it to you? And I'm just, I'm not reading the same words, but I'm just saying it. He says, then said David to Jonathan, who should tell me? Or what if thy father answer you roughly? 
It's, and some of us folks, we, we, we get in denial. We don't want to believe our beloved parents or our beloved leaders could do such a thing when they're so disgustingly ungodly. It doesn't even make sense. They need to repent and they need to do the first works over. Amen. I said it. And you can pass that one on. Uh, going to verse 27 and 28, it says, And it came to pass on tomorrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. David didn't go to this dinner. Say, and Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to me, neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, uh, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. Now Saul should have just said, Oh, praise God, that's good, amen. Let him enjoy his family. Listen to what it says, verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, his own son. Look at that, his own son. And he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman. Whew, man, he's talking about his mama. He says, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness, meaning that your mama wouldn't even want to deal with you if she knew what you did. He says, for as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Now that was Saul's problem right there, the whole kingdom issue. He knew that he was not going to be king long. He was mad. He was just the same spirit that Herod, Herod had with Christ. He was out of position, out of pocket, and he did not want to give it up. So what do you do? I'll kill him. There's no one else to take over. The same spirit that these leaders have, they see a ministry inside of you that God is birthing, and they look at it, and, and here's the thing I don't understand. Instead of them rejoicing that God has allowed such a gift to be underneath them, to be nurtured, and then planted, and then dispersed out, they get upset and jealous. And then they don't want you to go preach nowhere, they don't want you to teach nowhere, they're not gonna put you up to teach, and this is what they'll do. Knowing good and well somebody is not called to ministry, they will put them up instead. And they will boost them and back them and ostracize you. Look at Saul in action. Saul's in your pulpit, you better open your eyes. And if he is in there, you need to pack your bags and hit the road, Jack, like Ray Charles said, and don't come back no more. Here's a funny thing, and I'm... Before I go to this next scripture, I, I, I want to say this, but I need you to see me clearly, not in a little box. So what happens is we look at these leaders and we say, oh, the Lord, well, if they are wrong, we're gonna, I'm going to pray for them because God's going to turn them around. God's going to do this. Listen, they have not turned around because they don't want to turn around. And you praying ain't going to turn them around. So what you need to do is turn around and go the opposite direction. Listen. I'm going to tell you something. Here's one of the manipulating things they do. They say, well, God said he'll give you pastors according to my heart, feed you with knowledge and understanding. And I'm your pastor. Whatever you need, you get from me, your pastor. Well, years ago, God gave me a revelation on that scripture. And that's while I was pastoring. And so I'm not anti-pastor. So I'm not preaching that. But here's what I'm saying. There's, there's a greater revelation to that scripture because he said in plural, I'll give you pastors according to my heart. Amen. So when I was reading that, and the Lord spoke to me. Amen. And I'm not saying he spoke in an audible voice, but I'm saying he revealed unto me. And so I asked questions to myself. And I asked myself, what was my teacher's name? And so in answering myself, I had to say, well, which one? So I went back down. I said, well, first grade, Miss Petrie. Third grade, Miss Anderson. Fourth grade, Mr. Dollator. Now, when I get to junior high school, I ask myself the same question. What is your teacher's name? But now I've got multiple teachers in one day. And so what that let me know is that Listen, it's going to take more than one teacher to feed me with the academic knowledge and understanding that I need to grow and develop as a person in society. And it's the same thing spiritually. 
No one leader, preacher, or pastor has all that you need to go forth and grow in Christ. It's impossible. Number one, most of them are old, so they don't relate to this generation. Technologically, they're at a disadvantage. Most of them can't even text. A lot of them don't even know what a smartphone is. They still have a flip phone. I'm not talking down about them. I'm just expressing where they are. So it's not a sin that you're being fed from more than one place. Now, I'm not saying run out there and eat everything like a smorgasbord because spirits are catching. And you do need someone that's going to guide you in the spirit of love and according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you don't need to follow someone that's holding you in a spiritual bondage. God is releasing us in power from that nonsense. So we got to understand where we are in Christ and we got to know who he is and whose we are. So let's go back to uh, some scripture and let's read a little bit more. It says, uh, and Jonathan answered his father. Uh, I don't know if I read verse 30, but uh, we'll go, and get, go through it again. Um, and Jonathan answered his father, Saul, and said unto him, wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? You're like, are you trying to kill him? What do he do? Saul cast his javelin to smite him whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to kill David. He was so mad that David wasn't there and he felt that Jonathan was defending him. He threw a javelin at his own son, trying to kill his own son. Some of these leaders will hurt whoever it takes to get their little point or their little message or their little, you know, pity party or fit across, whatever it is. They'll do anything they think they have to do. You know, and, and then, you know, some of them go into these pity parties. You know, oh, 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 it's me. Oh, oh, it's me. But we'll, we'll get there. Um, Numbers 12, 5, and 8 says, My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and, and the similitude of the Lord shall, be, be, uh, shall he behold. He said, Wherefore then, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant? And now see, this is what they do. They manipulate you. They manipulate you in fear. And you don't, don't say nothing about the pastor. And you know in your heart that the pastor is really harming you. But he had those that, that are seeking favor. And I'll show you that in the scripture too. They seek the favor of the leader and so they'll be like, well, you can't talk about the pastor or, or they'll get close and, close and try to snug up. We call it brown nosing. Uh, they'll do these things because they're looking for fleshly uh, um, accolades. You know, some folks will, while the pastor is berating you, they will just lavish when the pastor says, but this one over here, yada, yada, yada. You know, they, they, they just suck it all up. But if they had the true heart of a Christian, as you call it, uh, they would feel remorse on the inside. And whether they do it openly or not, they would at least come to you and say, hey, I don't know what that was about. But listen, I, 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 I'm sorry that happened. I don't know what it was. Most of them won't do that because it's fear. There's fear. And, and this is what they do. They use this scripture here with Moses. Uh, they say, well, you know what? Don't nobody talk to me but God. Just God. And they can't hear nothing from nobody. It don't matter who it is. Nobody instructs me but God. And if they get a bishop call, they turn that back and that get fat and little buddy. Correct me but God. That's nonsense. <laughs> you got to give an account to one another. Amen. You have to give an account. And so they use this scripture and they say, hey, look, God talks to me face to face. And he does talk to his leader face to face. And therefore, he's telling his leader face to face that you're wrong. But there's too much pride there. They're not going to change that. They're not going to change it because they are bound down with this historically perpetual, systematically systemic bondage. We worry about the racial bondage in the country. 
but you're bound in the church. How does that make sense? But nobody wants to talk about that elephant in the room. So we go to church on Sunday and on whatever the Bible class night is, and we sit there and we just take it and take it. And they tell you, you know what? The Lord is going to bless you. He's going to bless you for how well you have been obedient. Man, you better knock that nonsense off. That's just the spirit of the devil. I don't need that. Don't need it at all. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It says, look not to every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And that's what we should be doing. Instead of trying to be built up by the pastor and instead of trying to, uh, to be one up on somebody, we should be looking at others and helping them, building them up. That's what we should be doing. But no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that at all. No, we, we're just man blasting and we're <laughs> trying to destroy people and, and don't even care about the wreckage and the carnage we leave behind. But like when I open up in the scriptures, they woe unto you pastors. I'm going to say this, woe unto you brown nosers too. Woe unto you cronies. Yes, woe unto you because God is going to make you pay as well. You, you're not getting by. You best know that. Nobody gets by. Nobody gets away. Let's read some more scripture here. and let's, let's, let's keep this thing going. Let's keep it going. Amen, amen. All right, we already talked about the servant Moses. Now, now here's the other thing, too. You have those that will keep, 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 keep kissing up uh, to the leader. And, and for what? what? What is the purpose of kissing up to the leader? Now, if you go back and you read in those portions, and I'm going to be long. Um, I don't want to wear you out. I know you've got work tomorrow. But when we, uh, when we look at, at those scriptures in 1 Samuel and in that 20th chapter or so, you're going to find where Saul, with his desire to kill David being so strong that when he found out where David was, he wanted somebody to say, hey, tell him, where's David? Where's David? Because uh, I, I need to kill him. I, 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 he's got to pay. He's got to pay. And there were individuals that said, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, he, he's over there with the priest. So he said, go get the priest. Call him over here. Call him over here. I want to see him. So the priest comes over. And he says, now, where is it that you've hidden David from me? You knew where he was all along, and you didn't tell me where David was. And the priest is basically saying, look, man, what, and I'm paraphrasing, so you just let me do that. The priest is pretty much saying, look, so I don't know what kind of beef y'all got going on, but um, I don't know nothing about what was going on with David. He was cool with me, so I'm just going to leave it like that, all right? I'm, I'm not trying to... Uh, uh, get at David. I'm not trying to have you mad at me. Uh, I'm not trying to do none of that. So I'm just going to just kind of like back off, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of this, man. I'm out, you know, and uh, so Saul gets upset. And, and Saul says, no, nah, no, nah, you, you know, you're not getting by like that, bro. And Saul wanted somebody to kill the man. And, and here's the funny thing about it. Saul's like, see, no, he, he, he pulled a present truck. See, nobody cares about me. See, nobody, you know what I go through, and, and, and it's been bad. And see, David did this against me, and all I needed is somebody to kill. And so finally, all the other men of Saul, of Saul said, nah, nah, I ain't killing no priest. Because Saul said, I want you to kill him and kill all his family, kill the children, kill the cattle, kill all of them. The ones that had godly fear said, no, nah, no, nah, nah, partner, you tripping now. I'm, I'm not with that. But there's always one. And that one, he said, you know what? I got you. I got you. And he killed that priest and killed all of his household and just was killing and killing and killing. You need to be careful of what you're doing and who you're following because you're following these ungodly leaders uh, that's trying to 
to kill folks spiritually because of their own personal gain, God is going to hold you accountable. He's definitely going to do that. He's going to hold you accountable and, and you're not getting away with it at all. You are not going to get away with it. You're not going to get away with it. Amen. Listen, <laughs> you have leaders that refuse to open up their financial books to let you see what's going on. And you know what they do? They tell you that, you know, God has not appointed or anointed you to that level of uh, servitude or, you know, in other words, you're not godly enough to know about the finances. Well, what do you mean? Someone will put their spouse over the finances. Hello, I'm going to leave that one alone. Amen. According to the law in a nonprofit organization, if you're a part of that, you have a legal right to ask for those books to see what the financial status is. They ain't going to tell you that, though. Well, we have a business meeting once a year, once every six months. How about every 30 days? How about a financial report read every 30 days? How many households or businesses do you know survive reading and, and, and culminating, coming together and, and looking at your finances semi-annually? Man, you'll be out of business before you can even blink an eye. Help us, Lord. Help us. <laughs> you know, God deals with me on a different level. I'm not on your level. No, you're not. You're beneath my level. The level of the devil. <laughs> Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Listen, there's only one true church, according to these leaders. You can't even go visit a church. You can't visit a church on your own. Somebody invite you to church, you can't even go. Why? You know, I don't been going over that, that church, you know, that, that there are cults over there and, and, and you're going to catch something over there. Listen, they are just fearful that your spirit might enjoy the praise and worship there. The word might be more meatier there. You might feel more spirit of the Lord there. And they don't want you to go because when you go, your tithes and your offering goes with it. This is that whole historically, perpetual, systematically, systemic bondage in the church. Amen. Saints of God, listen, we've got to be careful and we've got to be wise. God has given you gifts. God has given you ministries. He's given you the ability and the fortitude to do his will. And we can't let no demon from hell stop us from doing that. I don't care what their position is. Now, I'm not saying be disrespectful and belligerent. But you got to know who you serve. Scripture says you can't serve God and mammon. You're going to love one or hate the other. And that's what Frederick Douglass, one of his quotes was about. He was saying, listen, this Christianity of Christ I can get with that. But if I get with that, I can't get with your Christianity because it's flawed. There's something wrong with it. And what's wrong with it is out of the flesh. It's not out of God's spirit. It's out of the flesh. It's out of the flesh. There have been so many ministries that have not gone forth because leaders want to sit on those gifts. You have churches that have probably anywhere from 10 to 20 preachers in the church, pastors in the church, and they're doing nothing. They're just sitting down taking up a seat. Oh, they may teach a Sunday school lesson here and there. They may teach a Bible class here and there. They may even get to expound a little bit here and there. But what are they doing for the kingdom of God? Nothing, nothing, nothing. And if you sit there and you think, well, I'm just being obedient to the leadership and God knows my heart. He does know your heart. And he knows that every day you live, your heart beats, 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 and beats. And you, you're going to be soon to your last beat. And if you haven't done what he's called you to do, when you get to that last beat, 
you're going to be one of the ones saying, Lord, Lord, I cast out devils in your name. You're going to be like, when? When you was teaching the lesson? He said, depart from me, you that work in iniquity. I never knew you. You know, we did not have a relationship. I don't know you like that, not to be letting you up here in my kingdom. Step back. God's going to hold you accountable. He's going to hold you accountable. And it's not a scare tactic message, but I want to open your eyes to this, this slavery and bondage that's in the church. And, and listen, here's the funny thing, too. Uh, when I say funny, I mean ironic. A lot of people are struggling with the mindset of not going back to church since they've opened up to a certain level, you know, based on this COVID-19. But here's my belief, and this is just me. I think the majority of them were suffering and struggling with this systemic bondage. And therefore, they don't want to go back. And this is their perfect opportunity. God has opened the gates and says, you are released. Now go in power. You have been freed. You have been delivered. And like he told the woman that was caught in adultery, now go and sin no more. In other words, go and do my will. Don't get caught up following man again. Now he did give us leaders. But one scripture says, you have to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you have to try the spirit by the spirit. If you know that you are in tune with God's spirit and your spirit clashes with leadership, come on, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And all you need is two or three witnesses. You're one, and God is the other. You got to know them that labor among you, that's for sure, and are over you in the Lord. Now, some do watch for your soul, but the others watch for your soul because they want to make sure that you don't go anywhere. And that's distance-wise, and that's, you know, elevation-wise, that you go nowhere. Amen. So that's enough for now. Listen, be encouraged. The body of Christ is not dead. There may be issues in the church systemically that are systematically done. But listen, God is still the one sovereign power. And as long as we trust and believe in him, amen, God will bring us through. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We ask that you keep everyone that's hearing the sound of my voice, Lord. Sanctify them, lead them, guide them, direct them, O oh Lord. Help them break the bondage, Lord, that is holding them in, God. And Lord, give them peace in their hearts. Let them know that you are the author and finisher of their faith in Jesus' name. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Until Sunday, 2 p.m., God bless you.